You should have received one of these cups when you came in this morning. It's, uh, it's got a little juice in the bottom, and it's got a little tiny, tiny sliver of something we're calling bread. If you did not get one, please raise your hand and someone will bring that to you. I have an extra. Look at that. There you are. You got the special one. The bread is twice as big. Regularly, the church gathers together around the Lord's table. There, there's no table. You're going to have to imagine this being the Lord's table. It's a big table. And there's a place set at that table for every man, every woman, every boy, every girl who confesses Jesus Christ as Lord. And it's an opportunity for the church to come to a full stop. Set everything else aside. All of the distractions, all of the wars and the rumors of wars, all the worrying about is the roast going to burn in the oven this afternoon. Set aside all of those things. And focus. We live in the digital information age, and if you've had, a, if you have a computer, or if you have a smartphone, you have found yourself stuck with a device that is not cooperating. Maybe you call tech support, and the help desk gets on the phone, and the first thing they say is, "Reboot." Turn the power off. Wait a few seconds. Turn it back on. And it is reset. Your smartphone, your iPad, it gets full. One of the things I do every Sunday morning before I come up here is I, is I go on my iPad. That, you know, somebody used to complain that I preach from, a, from an iPad. And I said, well, Moses had two tablets. So there you go. What I do on my iPad is I, I double tap that home button and, and all of the running applications come up on the screen and I one by one close them all so that the only thing left running on my iPad during this moment is just what I need to do my job in front of you. And every so often, we have to do that. We have to reboot. We have to shut down the clutter that's running in the background of our minds. We've got to turn off the news. We've got to log out of social media. And we've got to just remember who we are. And more importantly, who God is. We've been singing this morning. Uh, I, I just, it just amazes me that, that week after week after week, I have absolutely nothing to do with what songs the worship team chooses for any given Sunday. I have nothing to do with it. I don't give any suggestions. Uh, Mike Hopper, our worship leader, knows ahead of time what I'm preaching on that Sunday. I've prayed over it. Mike prays over it. And Mike chooses and plans, and I prepare and I plan. And the Holy Spirit says, here's what we're going to do. I guess if you're a football fan, you could think of, of, of God the Holy Spirit as the offensive coordinator. Drawing up the game plan. Calling the plays. Communion, the Lord's table, is about slowing down to a complete stop. 
taking a few minutes. Now, we're taking a little bit longer this morning than we usually do for communion. Uh, I, wanna, I wanted to have a chance to speak into this a little bit more. I'm, I'm trying to accomplish two things this morning. I'm, I'm uh, leading us in a time of reflection and communion around the Lord's table. And, and then I'm going to introduce the new series of messages that we'll call this a trailer. Okay. T- today I'm sharing with you the trailer for the new series of messages that starts in earnest next Sunday. But before... Uh, we get to any of that. I'd like you to take your bulletin. If you got a bulletin when you came in, where, where we usually have notes for the message and where you fill in blanks, to, we do that to kind of keep you engaged. Some of you, some of you uh, like that. Using your hands as well as your ears and your eyes to fill in the blanks. But today there are no blanks to fill in. Today we just published in your bulletin, a passage of scripture that Paul used to speak to the church that was at the time meeting in the city of Corinth. And he had some instruction to give them about communion. And uh, if you you read a, a little bit earlier than the passage that I published, you read, he was chastising them a little bit. He was correcting some abuses that had crept into the church's observance of communion. Can you imagine? Those Christians way back long ago didn't have it exactly right. Hmm. And they needed to be refocused. Paul says, when it comes to the Lord's table, I have, I'm, I'm not going to congratulate you because you're doing some things you shouldn't be doing. And then he gave them these instructions. And um, I I want to call your attention to the second paragraph that starts, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. They were making those Christians... We're making the opportunity to come together as brothers and sisters around the Lord's table. They had a fellowship meal with it. And uh, they were abusing that and, and they were becoming cliquish. And they were making this an opportunity to celebrate how much they had and how well they were doing. Meanwhile, neglecting the fellowship of some in their community that weren't doing as well and didn't have as much. And so Paul says to those Christians who were coming to Communion Sunday carelessly, flippantly, casually, unmindfully, hey, if you don't come to the Lord's table with the right heart attitude, you're doing poorly. You're not doing right. Do you do well? Remember last week's question? Do you do well to be casual? about the meaning of the body of Christ broken for you and the blood of Christ poured out generously for you? Do you do well to make that just just an excuse to have a party? Do you do well? No, you do not. In this this climate of... uh, being careful in this climate of being careful about um, human contact and minimizing human contact, we've taken to using this method of communion so that um, we're, we're protecting one another from, as best we can, from any possibility of contamination. I'm not trying to be flippant about that. I'm not. We're trying to be careful. We're trying to be courteous and respectful of everyone. But that also means that you got handed this cup when you came in the building, whether or not you were ready. And maybe the assumption is, I have this thing, 
And I'd better do it when they do it. I'd better do it when they do it. I better eat that bread when they eat the bread. I better drink this cup at when, when they do that. Because if people look at me and they see that I'm not doing what everybody else is doing, they're going to think poorly of me. I won't fit in. I won't be like everybody else. Listen, my friends, we don't fit in. We're not like everybody else. We never have been. Not since Jesus claimed me have I been like everybody else. I'm not supposed to be like everybody else. I'm supposed to be the child of God, and I'm supposed to give that the weight that it deserves. Paul goes on, Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Hey, I'm not trying to frighten anybody here this morning. I'm not. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm not trying to shame you or embarrass you. I am repeating what God said to his people through his apostle Paul. We ought to be mindful of what we're doing on this occasion. Anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself And then he says, and that is why some of you are weak and ill, and some of you have even died. Bad communion can be fatal. Who knew that? If we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. I am going to read this psalm, Psalm 51, and I'm going to ask you to do what Paul urged as we come to the table, as we're about to peel back the foil and eat this bread in remembrance of Christ and drink this cup in remembrance of him. I'm going to ask you to take this moment and examine yourself. Am I ready for this remembrance? Have I considered the importance of what Jesus did for me? Am I Am I bending under the weight of the realization that Christ the Holy One gave his body to be broken so that I could be made whole? Let's take a moment and collect our thoughts and then I'm going to read Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. In sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being. And you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. 
Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings, and whole burnt offerings. And then bowls will be offered on your altar. Amen. Now, in that first part of that passage that we printed in the bulletin, Paul says, I deliver to you that which I have also received, that the Lord Jesus, on that night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them. Gene Bosick is going to lead us in a prayer of thanksgiving and ask God's blessing on the bread. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your amazing grace. Thank you that uh, our Redeemer lives and that he has paid uh, my debt of sin and that uh, my name and all who claim Christ, our names are written in heaven. We bless you and praise you and thank you, Lord. We thank you so much for your broken body given for us. Lord, when we reflect upon what you did for us, our hearts are humbled and um, reflective of your great sacrifice, your great mercy, your amazing grace. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done in our behalf. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The Lord Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This bread is my body is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Just listen to the sound all over the room. That's, uh, that's not people crunching their bread, I know that. People have funny ideas about communion. People visit churches and churches do communion differently. They have different beliefs about what is, what is going on with communion. I'm, I'm just going to debunk the idea that what you ate was anything other than a weird wafery piece of pressed flour and water or something. It's just bread. Nothing magical, nothing mysterious about it. It's just bread. The power in it is the symbolic words of Christ. I am the bread of life. Whoever receives what I have to give you, will never hunger. I will satisfy every need you have. When the supper was ended, the Lord Jesus took the cup. And again, he gave thanks and asked God to bless it. Steve Atulis is going to lead us in a prayer of thanksgiving for the cup and ask God's blessing over it. Steve. Father God. We thank you for putting forth this covenant. But we know that a true covenant takes two parties to enter in. Father, we need to do our part. 
we need to accept the fact that you sacrificed through the most extreme love we could imagine to give us this salvation. We thank you for this bread. We thank you for this cup, for what it signifies, for what it does for us, Lord, that it brings us salvation when we accept the fact that our Savior loved us enough to give his life for us. We enter into it, Lord, fully reviewing that we are not worthy, but you have made us righteous. So we thank you for this. We surrender our wills and our lives to you and ask your blessing upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The Lord Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. This do in remembrance of me. When you go home today and you talk to your family and you talk to your friends about what you did in church today, do not say, I took communion. You didn't take it. You received it. We received forgiveness of sin and the gift of eternal life. We received that. We did not take it. We did not grab it. We did not swipe it. God gave it. And we gladly received it. Thank you for sharing in that with me. My prayer as I came to church this morning is that you, that you would take that moment as seriously as I do. And that I would take that moment as seriously as Christ did. Okay, as a kid, many generations ago, I remember picking up the family Bible from the coffee table in the living room where it rested. How many of you have already got a picture in your head of a family Bible on a coffee table in the living room? You have that image to pop up on the screen? There it is. That's, that's, not, that's not an actual picture of, of our family Bible, but it's the closest I could come to it. It was a big, heavy, leather-covered book. Looked very impressive. Even before I could read, I used to turn the pages, that leather, dry, crackling leather cover. I would turn the pages. I couldn't read anything on any of the pages, but it looked impressive. And uh, our Bible had full-color paintings uh, on several pages throughout the Bible. There were full-color paintings of different stories, famous stories in the Bible. And I could, I could turn in that book to some of those paintings, and I would remember having heard those stories in junior church, children's church, kingdom kids... We didn't call it Kingdom Kids back then. We were not yet enlightened. But we, we, had, we had preschool church, and I heard flan, flannel graph is what we had, flannel graph. Some of you remember flannel graph. Great multimedia presentation, three-dimensional. I would look through that, that book, that holy Bible, and I would look at those pictures and I would turn the pages. And as I turned the pages, I noticed something. And then I kept looking for it every time I opened the book. I looked for those pages where the words on the page, though I couldn't read them, the words on the page were not printed in black ink, but red ink. And I asked my mother, why are there some pages where there are red letters? And she explained to me that those red letters were the words that Jesus spoke during his ministry on earth. That satisfied my curiosity. And so um, I kept looking at that Bible and I, would, I, I came to a part 
where, as you see it up there, and I, that's not a great picture. The color doesn't really do it justice. But there's this one part in the Bible where all the words are read. The whole page, left hand and right side, just like you see up there. And I, I said, Mom, look at this page. It's all read. And she said, that's right. That's the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, I was so happy to know that there was a thing called the Sermon on the Mount where all the words were read because Jesus spoke every one of them. And I couldn't wait until I could finally read those words for myself. But until that day came... I asked mom, and she was glad to oblige, and she would read them to me. And I learned to love the words of Jesus, especially those in the Sermon on the Mount. This morning, I'm just going to give the introduction, just the introduction to that sermon. I'll say a few things about it, and I'm going to share with you what a few other people said about it, and then... We're going to close in prayer and send you on your way. Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Here's the introduction to that sermon. The most famous of all of Jesus' public teachings. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and he taught them, saying... And then he began to teach. Now we have planned a total of 24 messages, 24 sermons on the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we could, I mean, Jesus just, just ta taught this in one afternoon. And if you, if you open your Bible to the red letters and you just read through it, you could read through it in a matter of a few minutes. And then you could push back from the table like you do on Thanksgiving and say, oh, that's too much. Go ahead, I invite you to read through the Sermon on the Mount this week. Go ahead, read through it. In fact, read through it every day. And see if you don't think, that's a lot. That's a lot. But over the next seven months, because 24 messages, but there's a few Sundays when we're going to depart from the series. You know, we got Easter Sunday. You can't talk about what Jesus said on the day he rose. <laughs> there's Mother's Day. You can't, you, can't, uh, you can't divert from mothers on Mother's Day or Father's Day. Father's Day is less important than Mother's Day. Everybody knows that, but. <laughs> Just ask Hallmark. Just ask. Do the work. But over the next seven months, this will take us past Labor Day. Oh, all spring and all summer. If you go away, be sure to be sure to tune in and watch online so you don't miss anything. Not, not because the preacher is so good, but because the material is so vital. We're going to look about, at what Jesus had to say about many different topics. Every area of life, every area of life, Jesus speaks to it in the Sermon on the Mount. Practical, spiritual, material, financial, Social, moral, physical. Jesus has something to say about all of that. In fact, could you play this little clip? I hope it'll work. Now that looks like a very interesting situation. My broker is really enthusiastic about it. What does your broker say? Well, my broker is E.F. Hutton, and E.F. Hutton says... When E.F. Hutton 
people listen. When E.F. Hutton talks, people listen. The, the idea of that commercial is, you listen to what E.F. Hutton says and you'll become wealthy. But when Jesus speaks, we really ought to listen. When Jesus has something to say, you and I really ought to put everything else that we're doing aside and lean in, turn our ear, turn the good ear, if you have one, and listen. Jesus speaks about us and our relationship with God, our relationship with our friends, our relationship with our enemies. Our relationship with ourselves. Sometimes the teaching of Jesus is a how-to guide. Other times, Jesus goes deeper and, and, and he tells us this is why to. The Sermon on the Mount is the longest recorded teaching of Jesus. It contains some of the most familiar and the best loved of Jesus' words. From the Beatitudes that will start next week to the golden rule, I won a pencil in Sunday school that had the words of the golden rule printed on it. You remember the golden rule. The Sermon on the Mount has been read, it has been memorized, it has been quoted, it has been taught, it has been preached about, written about. We've got songs that help to teach and remember Jesus' words. Already, some of those songs are coming back into your mind right now. I know they are. It seems that the thing it is most rarely done is lived. We're going to try to do better over the next seven months. Here are some quotes from some well-known people when they were talking about the Sermon on the Mount. Here's the first one. I do not believe that there is a problem in this country or in the world today which could not be settled if it were approached through the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount. Who said this? President Harry S. Truman. Common sense. Here's another quote. Most people are willing to take the Sermon on the Mount as a flag to sail under, but few will use it as a rudder by which to steer. Oliver Wendell Holmes, Sr. Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. was a Supreme Court Justice in the first 30 years of the 20th century. His father, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Sr., was a doctor, poet, and author, professor, uh, who lived and later died. <laughs> during the 1800s. And then here's this quote. As for caring for the Sermon on the Mount. If caring for here means liking or enjoying. I suppose no one cares for it. Who can like being knocked flat on his face by a sledgehammer? Well, this is why we're not going to try to do the whole Sermon on the Mount in one Sunday. How many sledgehammer blows to the face can you stand? We'll find out. That quote continues. I can hardly imagine a more deadly spiritual condition than that of a man who can read that passage with tranquil pleasure. Do you like the Sermon on the Mount? <laughs> Christian bobbleheads. Oh, yes, we like, we like it very much. Yes, yes, we do. If we could come to the Sermon on the Mount with that kind of attitude, we probably haven't comprehended it. This quote uh, was reported by C.S. Lewis, whose name I'm sure is familiar to almost everyone in the room. My prayer is that through this seven-month journey together with these three chapters, 
Matthew 5, 6, and 7, we will not only hear, not only learn, but also apply and especially practice this foundational instruction from our Lord Jesus Christ on how we're supposed to go about the business of living as a follower of Christ. I said to you earlier, we're different. We're different. We're supposed to be different. We're called to be different. And if you can think back to the day when you first decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. If you can remember that day in your life and compare the person you were then to the person you are now, I pray you can trace some differences in your life. That you are not who you were. I know I'm not. You are not who you were. You are different. And the difference between you and others around you who are not following Christ is getting bigger and wider every day. And if it isn't, the Sermon on the Mount is just what the doctor ordered. Next week, we'll start with the Beatitudes. This is the opening part of Jesus' teaching. You're going you're to recognize the words, blessed are the poor in spirit. Nine statements. We're going to look at the, the Beatitudes over the next three Sundays. Nine statements about the kind of person that finds favor with God. Not necessarily the kind of person that finds favor with other people. God's description of a person that he blesses, that he gives approval to, is very different than our culture today tells us is the measure of success. Don't worry about how many likes you got on your Instagram post. Don't worry about how many followers you have on Twitter. How many people are following you as you follow Christ? Don't worry about how well prepared you are to enter into a comfortable retirement. Instead, give thought to how well prepared are you to enter into the presence of the living God. Jesus is going to be speaking to us about our lives and how to live them. If you want to read ahead, go ahead. Can't hurt you. And see if um, you find any of the same conclusions that I'm going to point out. In the days coming. I'm going to finish early today. Write it down. It may not happen again. (laughs) I'm going to ask Mike to come. And I'm going to ask you to join me in a word of prayer. Father. I thank you for your word. Your word communicates to us. That you have been reaching for us. You've been reaching from the throne that Isaiah described and that we sang about earlier. You've been reaching to us that you might take hold of us and break the chains that have bound us, that have enslaved us to our sin and its certain consequence. We've reminded ourselves that we are yours, that your life is in us. Your blood is in us. Symbolically, I don't want anyone in the room who's overhearing me talking to you right now to to think any crazy thoughts. 
We are yours. You have bought us with a price. And you have every right to tell us how then we should live. And you have told us. Help us to have ears to hear, eyes to see, hearts ready to understand, and hands ready to practice what you have said. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Here we go. Praise God. Amen. You are dismissed.